know, make you feel good kind of messages. And, and that's what that's one thing I liked about the funerals here. Like uh, I remember attending my first funeral up in, in Wapapo. And, uh, and then, then they had, you know, the, uh, just a box, you know, uh, with a corpse in it, and we could all go in and meditate on it. And the corpse was not, had no cosmetics or anything, just the corpse as it, you know, with no attempt to make it look other than the way it was. And then we had, uh, you know, we contemplated the uh, death. And, and Lung Po Cha, his Desanas were all about death. And, and, and you're actually, you know, addressing the event in a very direct way. And I found that very uh, wonderful, you know, because you really need to, you know, death of some of another human has an effect on you. And, and uh, death is what we all, you know, know we, it's going to happen to us. And just the directness and the, and the, uh, you know, the usefulness of just contemplating what had actually happened. And uh, I didn't find it depressing or, you know, traumatizing. <laughs> anyway, it was uh, it was very helpful and 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 led towards uh, dispassion, like the asupa practices, in meditations in, um, in our tradition. Uh, you know, if they're done rightly, they're, they're not to make you feel averse and, and disgusted with everything, but to uh, lead towards dispassion, a sense of coolness, and rather than, uh, you know, uh, fear and or any kind of strong emotion and at one time we used to go to Siri Raja hospital and you know in the old days on to see the autopsies and uh, one day I, I went go on Monday because over the weekend there's a lot of murders and gruesome things happen so these there's a lot of interesting autopsies <laughs> And, and one day, one day, one Monday, I went in to Sir Roger, and the, the man in charge said, "I've got something special for you." So he took me to this, you know, took me to this place. The door was closed, but the stench was already seeping out through the cracks. And they opened the door, and, and uh, this terrible, you know, putrid smell attacked me. And and, uh, you know, I had to make, actually kind of force myself to go in because, the, you know, the, the smell was so bad, I just wanted to retreat from it. And then I went in and there was a, a rotting, bloated corpse. And they it, it found it in the, one of the clogs. And so it had been, you know, rotting for quite a few days. And probably a, a young man, and it was all bloated. And uh, in this room, you know, they put these bloated corpses in a special room for this. And you could see on the ceiling where things, you know, think when the body had exploded and the guts were <laughs> hanging from the ceiling. It's pretty, pretty uh, gruesome-looking place. But uh, and then this 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 corpse looked about ready to explode. So that's a bit of you know I could think about it and feel a bit anxious. But I I went up to it and I just noticed you know first there was this repulsion and uh, you know kind of seeing it in terms of it a uh, kind of hideous gruesome uh, sight and the smell and everything. But as I kind of let go of that reacting to that that feeling, then I became very calm. 
and uh, I started noticing the, you know, the kind of beauty of decay. You know how these, these, you know, that you could see these, these uh, worms crawling out of the mouth and the eyes, and you know, which are generally considered, you know, like horror images, but actually you're you're witnessing a natural uh, decomposition, which is. It has a certain beauty to it when you get past the initial kind of aversion or fear. So then I even went up and touched the the rotting corpse, you know, just just to to go past this this tendency to be repelled and and uh, and just dwell on, you know, get caught in this feeling of how horrible and and disgusting it is. And then when I came out of Sri Raja Hospital that day, I had this wonderful sense of this passion of re- you know just being totally cool inside. And uh, and I realized the the result of real, like a super uh, It was a, it was a very calm, collected, composed being. It could pass you know, the most glamorous and beautiful women and and there was total dispassion mm-hmm. and you kind of see this, this potential corpse and, <laughs> and, and even the most attractive people. And, and then we had to cross over the river from Sri Raja right into the area like Wat Mahatat and that where you go through these markets places and there was you know meat hanging in, on hooks and people selling uh, kwe tiao and all this and you felt that you know this, just like the corpse and it's kind of not you know it all looked like decaying meat and not uh, you know in any way uh, aroused <laughs> hunger or interest in it and then then the way one looked at other human beings was was through dispassion rather than through say uh, being attracted or or repelled by them so sometimes you know I remember my first instructions on the super gamaton were you know from the bhikkhu at Wat Bawan and 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 he was, he, he kind of indulged in, uh, in kind of, uh, kind of a sick indulgence in so disgusting the uh, ear dirt and the eye dirt. And it kind of, you'd almost feel he was getting high on, on being disgusted. And, <laughs> and it, I felt a bit, it felt like a perversion almost, you know, like it was a bit sick. And, uh, you know, like you were supposed to kind of tell yourself how horrible, disgusting it all is and create a kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a negative image of, of aversion where, you know, a super is, is not, doesn't mean, uh, you know, it means the non-beautiful, like super means the attractive, the beautiful, and a super is the negation of that. And then the English word disgust is is really, you know, it means it has a strong meaning of aversion, but actually it means like it's from the French or Latin, and, and, and you know, and it, like you lose your taste for for this, you know, you no longer see it in terms of of an illusion of it, of uh, attractiveness. This, uh, these kind of ways of, of of experimenting with, you know, to be able to to uh, develop a supergamaton in a way that it leads towards this passion rather than just, uh, you know, a sense of thinking that the world is disgusting and horrible or the human bodies are 
uh, you know, trying to convince yourself that they're not attractive or that you should be averse or disgusted by them, but you you actually not trying to to just uh, convince yourself or or play games with your mind, but actually through this mindfulness and reflectiveness, you begin to experience this uh, inner calm and coolness, which is, which I would call this passion. And that's the good result of, of a supa meditation. And it's like this skeleton and the and this what this this uh, plasticine vein. Yeah. These are I didn't find them uh, you know I found them interesting because but some you know people have very some had very strong reactions seeing it as perverse and sick. But. Uh, I didn't have that impression at all. And you can see like that, you know, they have one where you just see the whole nervous system of a, of a human individual. I mean, they've got, got rid of everything but the, uh, but the nerves. And uh, they have different, you know, all kinds of interesting exhibits of, you know, of, circulation and digestion and all the rest. I went to a funeral in Bangkok. This was years ago. Of very wealthy people and at one of the big temples there. And, uh, and there were hundreds of people at this funeral and then they had uh, they, during this funeral, they opened the coffin, and, um, and then this terrible stench came out of it. And then we were invited, you know, the monks were all invited to go up and look at the corpse. And, and everyone could do this, and it was quite, you know, I've never seen anything like this at a, at a lay person's funeral. And... Uh, they had a picture, a photograph of the woman that w- had died, and you know when she was, you know she she died quite young. I think she was about fifty or so when she died. So it wasn't an old woman, but you had this this photograph of her, uh, uh, and then you saw this uh, rotting, putrid corpse inside. It was you know greenish and foul, and, and in the in you know, really in the state of uh, advanced decay. And and everybody, you know, was encouraged to go and look at it. And, uh, of course, being a monk, but uh, a lot of people wouldn't, you know, they just couldn't take it. But I was impressed that, that they would do that, you know, it was a great... That it was, you know, it was a kind of well-to-do family. They had this huge, huge funeral. And they don't need me. That's the only time I've ever seen that done. The one time they, at Sri Rot, they had they had. Uh, a man who'd been murdered. Uh, he'd been a, a Samlor driver, and he was about in his fifties. And so the the man that was uh, com- performing the autopsy, you know, exposed the lungs, uh, and and they were black, coal black, with uh, pollution and probably cigarette smoke and of course all the you know the sam lore written in them where they you know the exhaust fume comes right come right into the sam lore so that was uh, 
interesting. Then they, following that, they had a, a young woman who committed suicide. And of course, she, she was, you know, maybe a 20-year-old woman. And her lungs were in a kind of a delicate pink color. <laughs> <laughs> had, hadn't <laughs> that, that's quite you know when you when you live, when you're in Bangkok you know you're very much aware of this pollution that you're breathing in all the time of course if you're a sandlow driver you must you know it must be it take a great toll on on your health. In, in in England, for example, if they they have uh, you know like somebody, an, say an English person who, who who is a Buddhist dies, and then uh, maybe they must have a funeral at Amravati, and so you, you know their relatives come who know nothing about Buddhism, and. Usually we, we have, we built the temple there, we have behind the main shrine uh, in the temple is a, called a chapel of rest. It's a, a room behind the main shrine uh, where you can put a, a body uh, and it have this, uh, this beautiful, uh, um, called engraved glass reclining Buddha in there, it's huge, you know, plate glass. Uh, and then the, we put the coffin into this into this room, and and then uh, you know it's open, and, and you can go and meditate. We we go and chant and meditate on the on the body. And so, when the English person dies, then you know we we do this, and we encourage the relatives to go and look at the. The, the body. Some will, some won't do it because they, they're so, you know, something they, they can't make themselves do. But then, uh, you know, we have a, a certain ceremony of chanting, uh, matiga, and things like that. And then they ask me to give a reflection. So I just give reflection, you know, anicca, wada, sangra, and, and just the kind of basic. Buddhist uh, reflection on death and impermanence you know nothing fantastic and afterwards some of these people come up and tell me how wonderful that was how helpful it was you know just you know these are like British people who who don't know anything about Buddhism but they you know they, they in the when they hear Dhamma like that, it, you know, they find it helpful, and rather than off-putting or or strange, because usually, like in an ordinary in funerals in Britain, are usually, you know, like at a crematorium, you you got fifteen twenty minutes, and then <laughs> you know, it's just, it, just get it in there and say the prayers and do all, and then get rid of the body as quickly as possible. So my intention at uh, Amravati was to to try to kind of make a funeral death of a person more significant, so you're not just trying to get rid of the body and and uh, and ignore the event. And so this many people find this this very uh, helpful in just dealing with uh, this this in this natural. Condition, you know, that that we we're all going to die anyway, and then and then uh, you know the loss of loved ones, loft is the part of every human experience. You know, so you reflect on this that the the death, seeing your parents get old and die, and you know your 
friends die and you know death is a part of, of one you know thing. what we love and cherish is going to die and, and we have to experience that usually before uh, oneself dies and even though that's so obviously a fact of life not many people have consciously accepted that or or appreciate that you know I would, you know so many people say why did they have to die or this why is this happening to me or you know they they think that they shouldn't have and one one woman you know her mother her mother died at I think at a hundred years and this woman was why did she have to die a you know, hundred years I mean that <laughs> that's pretty good <laughs> why did she have to die <laughs> and this is you know one can understand that emotional reactions but, but this reflective style is so useful you know to, to bring into consciousness your fears or dreads and you know to to be able to to make them conscious and not as, as, you know but in this way of reflecting in terms of Dhamma rather than in terms of just you know creating more kind of dreadful emotions around you like I found you know like all kinds of you know fear is one of our primal emotions this is a fear realm that we are living in you know so there's a lot to be frightened of you know just you know because you realize your your very vulnerable form you know, the, the human form isn't uh, you know doesn't have a has a very soft skin and it's easily damaged so just on that level you know there's a lot to f- naturally fear and then of course, now we've we've got all the animals in cages, so we don't we don't have to deal with bears and wild elephants and tigers. But um, you've got some pretty crazy people in London, <laughs> wild <laughs> mad people around. You know, the humans are much more dangerous than uh, bears or tigers, and so the the fear is is a, and you see it in the animal realm it's all survival isn't it because the you know everything is subject to to being killed or consumed now then you know we the humans we can create laws and agree on moral precepts so you know the first precept is bound on the not to intentionally kill another human but in spite of that you know we still you know, we, we we try to make, you know, support each other's existence through the moral precepts. And then we have laws and punishments for for murder and, and killing and whatnot. But still, uh, you know, so we have a kind of maybe a sense of security that we wouldn't have if we were living, say, in a jungle or a place where there was just, you know... The, the laws of morality and and of society didn't apply so it does give you but still the the fear haunts us because there's a lot of anxiety and worry various kind of neurotic fears that that modern people are obsessed with you know in their daily lives and just anxiety and worry for one thing and that's where the reflective style bringing, you know, beginning to really look at the tendency to worry. Is you know what's going to happen? Uh, you know what will be the future of Nana Chat? And then we can start worrying about it. <laughs> uh, you know, will I? You know, my health, will I have good health or is there something, you know, some kind of terminal ailment that's going to, I'm going to experience, I could worry about all kinds of possibilities of loss and pain and and misery in the future. 
and then bringing that that tendency to worry into consciousness is is observing worry is like this it's a, it's all about the future you know things might not go the way I want them to or I might be you know lose my mind I might be going senile you know as you get older you, your memory isn't so good so every time I I can't think of something I think oh Alzheimer's <laughs> Uh, the beginning of our time <laughs> uh, this is uh, because these are you know the future for someone my age is what what's in store for me in the future really is death increasing aging and death and so this is you know that this also in terms of uh, reflective meditation is very important to, to to get the perspective on this, on the aging, uh, the aging process that's taking place in the in the body, and then the, the uh, how the mind also is affected by age, and and you, and so you're you're learning from aging and sickness and loss rather than just dreading it and resenting it and resisting it or denying it. So like this practice will take you through the whole span of your life, you know, from the present to to the death of, of your physical body. And it includes, so it gives you a, a way of learning from this form, this lifetime, uh, in a way that you you know, you're not. You're, you when when the death moment comes, you you don't have this fear and anxiety. You know, you're you're prepared. You're ready for that final event. You know, the the death moment. So it's, uh, you know, the modern society is about trying to create images of perfection and beauty and, and uh, you know, this ideal of progress uh, that was brought up with this is that, you know, everything's going to, should be progressing and advancing. So, and then, then this, uh, you know, the ups and downs of the economies, the boom and bust, economic problems, and, you know, the idea of evolution and progress is, is very much, you know, instilled in you when you're in, in a cultural way. But in terms of Dhamma, you're beginning to, to see things, how, you know, progress, is, is just one half of it and then it reaches a peak and then it goes the other way. And that's just the natural pattern of conditioned phenomena. And so this, this is where you're not thinking in terms of, of uh, making every, you know, that life should be getting better and better and more advanced and happier and happier, but you're learning the way it is in terms of Dhamma through just observing your breath and your own body and your your own uh, emotional tendencies and and the the things that you experience uh, in your life uh, praise and blame happiness and suffering 